introduction. The official trailer for the upcoming historically based movie The Woman King was released on the 6th of July 2022 and it has serious problems. I'll be focusing mainly on historical errors including combat but I'm sure that professional costumers and film critics will find plenty to pick apart in various aspects of the film's cinematography. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Throughout this video, I'll be referring to the so-called Dahomey Amazons with their historically accurate name in the Fon language, the Minon. Note that the names Naniska and Nawi are anglicizations of original names in the Fon language, and in that language, they don't actually sound like Naniska and Nawi. Note, I will also be pronouncing the commonly used name Dahomey as Dahomey, since it is actually a French word derived from an earlier word in the Fon language. So I'll be using the French pronunciation. It's unclear exactly when the woman king is set, but we do know that Naniska, Nawi, and King Gezo are all represented as contemporaries. This is historically inaccurate since Gezo died in 1859, while Naniska and Nawi weren't even born until at least a decade later, so it would be impossible for either of them to have ever met him. One way the movie may get around this is to play with the timeline and set the events much earlier, perhaps during the start of Gezo's reign in 1818, though this would create even more historical inaccuracies. A few websites are reporting the movie is set during the franco dahomeyan Wars. One of them says, quote, The French and neighbouring towns who have disrespected the honour and enslaved the people of Dahomey and all they live for, end quote. This may be referring to the first franco dahomeyan War, which only lasted two months, or the second, which lasted two years. However, the franco dahomeyan Wars didn't even start until 1890, long after Gezo was already dead. Again, the movie may avoid this by playing with the timeline, or perhaps these websites are wrong and the European enemy isn't the French after all. The opening titles of the trailer announce, quote, Her reign begins now, end quote clearly referring to the movie title, The Woman King. In reality, the Minon were always subservient to the Dahomey king since they were his personal bodyguard and none of them ever became king. In particular, the historical woman played by Viola Davis certainly never became king. The next scene shows a group of cavalry riding across a plain with a voiceover from John Boyega, who plays the Dahomey king, Gezo, saying, quote, an evil is coming, end quote. The cavalry belong to the Oyo people, who are now called Yoruba, and they are on their way to fight the Dahomey. Naturally, viewers are expected to regard the Oyo cavalry as the evil which is coming and to sympathize with the Dahomey, who will defend themselves. The Oyo and the Dahomey did go to war repeatedly, and in fact, for a long time, the Dahomey were under the control of the Oyo Empire. However, if the movie is set within the historical reign of Gezo, then these events must take place after 1818 when he came to the throne. If this is the case, then the scene with the Oyo cavalry may be during the Dahomey Revolt of 1823. This was indeed a time when the Oyo attacked Dahomey, but if the movie is depicting this event, will it explain that the reason for the Oyo attack was that the Dahomey had been conducting slave raids on villages which were protected by the Oyo? The Oyo cavalry in this trailer would be riding out to protect their people against the Dahomey slave raiders. This certainly doesn't make the Oyo evil. A voiceover from Gezo continues by saying that this evil which is coming, quote, threatens our kingdom, our freedom, end quote. This is highly ironic given that the Dahomey Empire was at this time engaged in multiple wars of conquest intent on enslaving as many of its neighbours as possible to sell to Europeans. They certainly weren't very interested in freedom for other people. The Dahomey were facing the Oyo people because the Dahomey had been enslaving Oyo people. Let's be clear on this. The Dahomey were fighting specifically to uphold their slave trade. This particular part of the trailer also provides a first glimpse of the movie's main villain, identified in media coverage of the movie as, quote, a colonial overlord called Santo Ferreira. This person is not a historical figure of the period, but an invented enemy. The name could indicate a villain who is Spanish, Portuguese, or Brazilian. <laughs> 
This would be very anachronistic if the movie is set in the 1890s during the franco dahomean Wars, but it would also be historically inaccurate even if the movie is set around 1823 during the Dahomey Revolt. Additionally, Ferreira's clothing looks more like it's from the 18th century than the first quarter of the 19th. The invention of this adversary is ironic, given the fact that the historical King Gezo was actually strongly supported by Francisco Félix de Souza, a Brazilian slave trader who helped Gezo seize the Dahomey throne in a coup d'etat in 1818. Instead of an imaginary European villain, the movie should be showing the very real European ally of Dahomey who colluded with Gezo to capture African people in the region and sell them into slavery. If the movie is depicting the Dahomey Revolt of 1823, will it show that Gezoza was sent by Gezo to make peace with the Oyo after the Oyo complained about Dahomey's repeated slave raids into Oyo territory? It's possible. In fact, this may actually be hinted at by the trailer's depiction of Gezo as reluctant to go to war with the Oyo. Historically, the Oyo eventually attacked and Dahomey defeated them decisively, becoming independent of the Oyo Empire. This was the end of the Dahomey Revolt. It could be that the movie will depict this event and represent it as a wonderful victory for freedom. However, not only was this merely one slave trading empire defeating another slave trading empire, Dahomey's involvement in the slave trade became even worse from this point, increasing their slave raids even further afield. After a voiceover from Naniska identifies the Europeans as wanting to conquer Africa, the next voiceover from Gezo announces, quote, but we have a weapon they are not prepared for, end quote. This gives the impression that the Minon are a formidable fighting force which will overcome the unsuspecting Europeans. In reality, the Europeans had known about the Minon since at least the 18th century and were not concerned by the prospect of fighting them. They knew the Minon were primarily used for slave raids, so they were mainly used to fighting unarmed civilians or opponents who were militarily much weaker and less well-trained than themselves. So the Minon were certainly not a weapon the Europeans were unprepared for. The Minon may have fought occasional skirmishes before the 19th century, but there is firm evidence for only one use of the Minon in battle before that time. The earliest evidence we have for them being regularly engaged in warfare dates to 1830, seven years after the Dahomey Revolt. According to an account by King Gezo himself, the Minon were only used regularly from this point on to compensate for a lack of male soldiers, which had been lost in very large numbers in previous years. During this time, Gezo used the Minon in various battles against the Mahi people, though never by themselves, only as an auxiliary force alongside the main army, which consisted entirely of men. Although the Minon were sometimes victorious against the Mahi, European observers record battles in which the Minon suffered extremely bad losses when faced with better prepared enemies. On one such occasion, when King Gezo used the Minon alongside his other Dahomeyan soldiers in a battle against the Mahi, the Dahomey army was crushed and Gezo barely survived with the rest of his army due to a heroic defense by the Minon. In that particular battle, the Minon lost half of their soldiers, a shocking loss of life and prestige. European views of the Minon varied over time, with some observers considering them undisciplined and unskilled, while later reports praised their combat discipline, bravery, and occasionally saying they were better than the Dahomey male soldiers. Some of the highest praise for the Minon comes from French and Portuguese observers who saw them fighting with Europeans during the late 19th century. Despite this praise, European military leaders did not regard the Minon as a significant threat. During the franco dahomeyan Wars of the late 19th century, the Minon repeatedly suffered huge casualties against their French enemies, who had superior weaponry and were better trained. In one battle with the French, the Dahomey lost between 600 and 1,500 soldiers, many of the Minon, while the French lost only eight. In 1892, after one particularly brutal engagement with the French, the Dahomey king Galele himself reported that he had sent 434 men on to the battle and 417 of them had been killed, almost the entire group. In contrast, in the same battle, the French had lost only seven men. This battle was so devastating that Galele acknowledged he now knew the empire of Dahomey would be destroyed. So the Europeans were not only completely prepared for the Minon, 
they defeated them easily every time they encountered them in pitched battle. In the next part of the trailer, we see European ships which look like they date to the 18th century rather than the 19th, since we certainly see no steam engines, despite the fact that they were on ocean-going vessels at this time. We also see European sailors wearing clothes which look quite like 19th century British Navy uniform, but with some historical inaccuracies. They are wearing the tricorn hat which had fallen out of use by 1800, and cravats of a style belonging to the 18th century, not the 19th. They don't look anything like Portuguese sailors either. We also see a rear view of the villain, Santo Ferreira, who is carrying a small sword. This was a small civilian weapon of the 17th and 18th century, but much less used after that time. During the 19th century, it was mainly used only as a last resort weapon among some infantry regiments, as well as being worn by officers for ceremonial functions. Even in 1823, it would certainly not have been worn casually in public by a civilian. The fact that no one else is wearing one just makes this anachronism even more obvious. In the next section, Naniska comments, quote, some things are worth fighting for, end quote. The historical Naniska thought slaves were worth fighting for and the slave trade was worth fighting for. But the trailer doesn't say this. It represents Naniska as fighting for freedom. Historically, the Minon were very enthusiastic about enslaving people and even Gezo himself was urged by the Minon to launch attacks on the city of Abeokuta, where many ex-slaves had fled for refuge. We then see the words, quote, based on powerful true events, end quote. This is a fairly generous description given the extent to which this trailer distorts the real historical events. I have another video on this topic in particular. See the link in the video description. In the next section, a voiceover from Naniska says, quote, you are called to join the king's guard, end quote. In reality, the Minon women warriors of Dahomey were not called, and this was not a privilege. There was no voluntary recruitment procedure. Many of the Minon were not even Dahomey. They were slaves who had been captured from Dahomey's neighbors and forced to become Minon. Some of the Minon were Dahomey women whose parents believed they were too rebellious or disobedient, and so gave them to the king to keep them out of trouble. Occasionally, Dahomey women were forced to become Minon when the king had a quarrel with their families. Now, the movie may show some or all of this, and it certainly should, but if it does, then it will certainly be exposing how empty these words of Naniska's are. During this section, we also see the Minon engaged in completely unrealistic military training. This all looks very cool and realistic to the untrained eye because it's the same kind of Western-style stage combat which Hollywood has been showing in movies for about a century, so audiences expect it. In reality, we have very little information about exactly how the Minon were trained. We do know that they used swords, but in the 19th century, they were certainly not trained in sword-to-sword combat. Instead, swords were typically only used by the Minon as a secondary weapon to kill wounded enemies or cut off heads for trophies. We do have some evidence that the Minon trained in archery, but the movie trailer does not show this. In a letter written in 1726, Dahomey King Trudeau Agaja provides a little information, writing of his soldiers, including the Minon, exercising, quote, by running, leaping, and firing their arms as if engaged, end quote. When he says firing their arms, he means firing their guns, which at this time were smooth bore flintlock muskets. And when he says as if engaged, he means as if they were in combat against real enemies. Agaja's mention of firearms is particularly important since a long musket was the Minon's primary weapon and had been since the 18th century when they were first formed. It was also the weapon for which they were the most well known and which they valued the most. Minon battle songs record how important their guns were to them, talking of how the muzzle blasts would light up the night and how the cloud from their muskets would obscure the sun by day. However, when making historical movies, Hollywood has an aversion to showing non-European people with guns, especially if they're native, Aboriginal, or Indigenous people. For Hollywood, guns are European, and non-European native people wouldn't ever use them. Hollywood prefers to give native and Indigenous people simpler, less complicated weapons, 
despite the fact that virtually every time indigenous people encountered European firearms, they adopted them as quickly as possible and used them not only to fight each other, but also to defend themselves against the Europeans. The sword training shown in the trailer is typical Hollywood stage fighting, which bears no resemblance to reality. It's basically the usual drill of people taking turns hitting each other's swords politely without any attempt at even aiming their weapons at each other or parrying or counter-attacking in any way. One of the Minon is seen pulling their sword with one hand well behind their body and turning their now completely unprotected body toward their opponent while they are well within striking range, which is a great way to get killed. However, their training partner doesn't take any advantage of this and instead politely waits with their sword back instead of counter-attacking, leaving them completely defenseless and open to an opportunistic strike. As someone who has trained in various forms of sword combat over the last five years, I know how unrealistic this kind of stage combat is. It's also noteworthy that some of the Minon are attempting to hold their sword in two hands, looking very clumsy and awkward since the swords they are using are only designed to be wielded with one hand. Since the grip only has room for one hand, the second hand is clasped over the top of the first hand, a very awkward and uncomfortable position which reduces the sword wielder's range of motion. Hollywood loves spears but doesn't know how to use them properly, so in this section we also get the usual spear-twirling antics we see in other movies, and of course the classic body spinning as part of the attack, even though all this is useless. It's just a very energy-intensive way of positioning your spear so that it's impossible to either attack or defend yourself, while deliberately turning your back on your opponent and permitting them to hit you easily while you are completely defenseless. We also see the spear held with both hands positioned in the middle of the weapon, reducing both range and power dramatically. In the small section of the trailer in which we see one of the Minon attacking a straw dummy with their spear, we don't even see the spear strike land, but if it did land, it's clear it would have hit the dummy's lower torso or upper thigh at best, which is a complete waste of time given the easier and faster strike would have been to the neck or face, virtually guaranteeing the opponent would be killed outright, or at least completely debilitated. In contrast to the spears used historically by the Dahomey, the spears in the trailer are far too short and their blades are far too narrow, making them very ineffective cutting weapons anyway. In the next section, we see the Minon soldier Nawi engaged in some sophisticated unarmed combat, performing the kind of takedowns seen in modern mixed martial arts and judo. There's no evidence the Minon ever underwent this kind of training, which is no surprise since it was a complete waste of time even in the 18th century when the Minon were formed, let alone the 19th century when it was equally completely useless. This is just eye candy for the modern audience, which wants native and indigenous people to do unarmed martial arts to emphasize that they don't use modern technology. It's a common condescending anachronism. In the next section, we're shown the words, quote, witness the most exceptional female warriors to ever live, end quote. This is an unusual way to describe a king's bodyguard which were primarily used as slave raiders and which had a very uneven track record on the actual battlefield against other armies. From 1830 onwards, when they became used regularly in the Dahomey army, the Minon experienced several crushing defeats and regularly struggled against the soldiers of Dahomey's African neighbours. When confronted by European armies, they were typically annihilated. After this, we get more extremely bad combat, showing the Minon again using swords and spears rather than firearms, and fighting against other people who are only using swords, which is again completely anachronistic. From the fact that they are fighting other African people, we can guess they are fighting the Oyo, but there's no sign of the Oyo's traditional weapons or battle array. Not only were the Oyo known for their cavalry, armed with swords, spears and shields, but their foot soldiers also used full body shields and fought with swords and spears in close formation, very like Roman armies. We don't see any of that here. This section of the trailer should show the Minon as they would have been fighting at this time, carefully arrayed in large squares of gunners, 15 rows deep, firing repeated volleys of bullets as the Oyo attempted to advance on either horse or foot. This was standard Minon battle strategy from as early as 1777, so the idea of the Minon splitting up and running wildly around the battlefield, attempting to engage individual opponents with their spears or swords, is completely unhistorical and unrealistic.
Instead, we're shown a Minon soldier holding a spear one-handed and doing something completely ineffective with it, not even pointing it at their enemy, and it's hardly surprising when the spear is blocked easily by a one-handed sword. This is completely ridiculous behavior because it totally wastes the spear's primary advantage, which is its range. In this particular exchange, the result is that another enemy is easily able to step close enough to strike them with their sword, only instead of doing that, they just hold it up in the air, waiting politely while the Minon soldier draws their own sword single-handedly and waves it vaguely over the head of their opponent, who obligingly falls back as if he has been hit, even though there was clearly no contact whatsoever and there isn't a scratch on him. Then we see Naniska given a sword and she runs towards an incoming enemy who is holding a rifle sideways across their body instead of either shooting Naniska with it or at least pointing it towards Naniska to use as a makeshift spear or club. Naniska jumps onto a conveniently placed box from which she launches herself into the air with her sword high above her head, making herself completely helpless and vulnerable to any kind of attack her opponent pleases to use. Instead, the enemy holds his rifle horizontally above his head to protect himself from Naniska's descending sword, even though there's absolutely no reason to engage the sword at all, and he could simply step to the side and club her with his rifle when she lands. Again, this is not proper combat, it's just silly eye candy for the audience. As the soldier raises his rifle, the body and barrel start to break, and the rifle splits apart in the middle as the scene continues. It looks like this is a prop which was supposed to break when Naniska's sword hit it, but it started breaking too early, and the shot ends just as Naniska's sword makes contact with the already broken rifle. Of course, there's no way her sword would be able to break not only the thick wooden body of the rifle, but also its steel barrel. Whatever this is, it certainly isn't history. We then see Nawi running obliquely at a soldier with a rifle, approaching him from his blind side as he aims his rifle in front of him. Nawi is completely unarmed, which is totally unhistorical, and launches a karate or Muay Thai style kick at him, which, after a bad cut, sends him flying through the air as if he is being pulled by a wire, which is in fact quite likely. In this scene, we see he is armed with a saber on his left hip, and if combat was already this close, he would certainly have been using either his saber, or even more likely, the bayonet on his rifle. Unfortunately, the prop managers anachronistically didn't give his rifle a bayonet. Later, there's a scene in which Nawi appears to be romantically involved with the man. Although the Minon were supposed to be celibate, since they were the king's wives, some of them did engage in romantic relationships with other men, for which they were typically punished severely, sometimes executed. Near the end of the trailer, there's some additional extremely bad combat, though curiously it also contains at least a nod to history. We see a large group of Minon, together with male soldiers, armed with swords and spears, running towards an incoming group of enemy infantry, which look like Oyo, who are similarly armed. Neither group is in any formation, with soldiers being distributed randomly across the battlefield, despite the fact that historically both sides would have been following well-established battle tactics. Both groups are also extremely small, with barely 100 on each side at most, whereas historical Dahomey and Oyo armies numbered in the thousands. As they run towards the enemy, the Minon come up behind a thin line of Dahomey male soldiers who are kneeling down, some of whom are also aiming guns at their opponents. This is the first time the trailer shows the Dahomey using guns, but the Minon aren't using them. Instead, the Minon leap up onto the backs of the kneeling men who don't have guns and use them to jump high into the air, holding their swords above their heads as the Oyo infantry close, placing the Minon directly in front of their own troops who are trying to fire their muskets at the enemy. This is a great way to get killed. The Minon are flying through the air towards their enemies, completely vulnerable and helpless, with their swords behind them, not even in front of them in a defensive posture, and their opponents can easily stab them with spears or swords as they come down. When your frontline soldiers are already armed with guns pointed at the enemy and you only have a sword, you should be standing behind or beside them because jumping in front of them not only results in you losing the protection they provide, but will also prevent them firing because they might hit you instead of the enemy. The whole point of having troops on the front line armed with guns is so they can kill as many of the enemy as possible 
before you need to engage them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In this case, the Dahomey front line has a pitifully small number of soldiers with guns, with only half of the eight men in the front line holding guns, while the other four are kneeling down with their swords on the ground, completely useless for either attack or defense, and totally vulnerable to long-range attacks by the enemy. None of the frontline troops are even carrying spears, despite the fact that they are an obvious weapon with which to defend a front line, since they provide a significant range advantage. The battle array in this movie looks almost intentionally designed to make the Dahomey army look stupid and ineffective. The front line consists of a single line of only eight men, only half of whom are armed with firearms, and even they are quickly rendered useless as their own soldiers jump in front of them, preventing them from firing. This is not even remotely like the way the Dahomey fought historically, and it is definitely nothing like the way Gezo organized his own troops on the battlefield. In 1851, Gezo staged a mock battle to demonstrate his military strength to visiting Europeans. His army was extremely carefully arranged on the battlefield, following very typical European-style formation. He had two very large wings of male musketeers arranged in a wide crescent, with scouts beside them for battlefield reconnaissance. Behind them, he had a large detachment of men as reserve troops and a rear guard. Gezo himself was in the centre, with thousands of Minon surrounding him in formation. As the battle proceeded, the Minon were launched from the wings or front line of the Dahomey army. This is sensible battle array. On another occasion on which Gezo showed off his army to European visitors, he had his musketeers organised into several formations, 50 men wide and 5 or 6 deep. The first line of men would fire their muskets, then move behind the formation to reload in safety, while the next line of men would fire before they moved back to the rear to reload. Each line of men would do this successively in order to maintain a continual barrage of volley fire. This was the same standard European method of organising musketeers which had been used in Europe since the 16th century and had been used by Dahomey's military since at least the 18th century. Once again, the trailer isn't making any attempt to show Dahomey's army behaving realistically, historically, or even sensibly. There's one more historical point to mention which isn't shown in the trailer and probably won't be in the movie either, especially if the events are set early in the 19th century rather than in the late 19th century when Naniska and Nawi actually lived. In The Woman King, Viola Davis plays the Dahomey warrior Naniska, who was a historical figure. At this time, Naniska was 16 years old, but the role clearly requires an actor of Davis' caliber, so the age difference between actor and character can easily be overlooked. More important for the movie and its theme is the historical fact that Naniska was killed by the French in the First franco dahomeyan War. An eyewitness account from the French colonial administrator Jean-Marie Bayol reports that he saw her dead, quote, on her back with her arms extended, end quote. Bayol recognized her, having previously seen her alive three months ago when she was beheading a slave in front of European guests to prove she was battle-worthy. It will be interesting to see if Daniska dies in battle in the movie. The movie itself is due for release on the 16th of September 2022, just a few days from now. Then we'll see exactly how dedicated the writers, directors and producers were to depicting accurately the historical events they claim to be representing faithfully.